Okay, well, good morning, everybody. It's a couple minutes after nine, and so we've let people get situated here. And so I'd like to welcome you all to the second to last uh, Friday morning Bureau seminar series. And so we're really fortunate to have our very own Dr. Bridget Scanlon. Uh, she's a senior research scientist here at the, at the Bureau of Economic Geology. Uh, her degrees in, are in geology with a focus on hydrogeology. She's worked at the university since uh, 1987. And her current research focuses on various aspects of water resources, including global assessments using satellites and modeling. Uh, topic today we'll, we'll hear more about management related to climate extremes and water energy inter interdependence. She serves as an associate editor for water resources research and environmental research letters and has authored or co authored about 170 publications. Dr. Scanlon is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and the Geological Society of America, and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. So welcome, Dr. Scanlon. Thank thanks you. Thanks a lot, Brian. I appreciate it. Um, thanks for coming, folks. Um, um, it's been a while since I just uh, want to show that I'm still alive and still <laughs> by doing a talk. And uh, it was really nice to have the, the Jackson School Award Ceremony yesterday evening and see our folks get recognized, uh, Alex Sun and uh, Steve Laubach and uh, Sahar. So that was really cool. Um, and it's nice to see people in, in person and not talk to the wall for a Zoom <laughs> presentation. So today I'm going to talk about uh, applications of gray satellite data to uh, water resources. And... Um, I uh, would like to acknowledge that this work began when the Jackson School was uh, started and when we had an opportunity to fund uh, postdoc students uh, in the uh, early to mid 2000s and it was uh, really new for us and it was a great opportunity and our associate director Ian Duncan helped us navigate through that and so some of the people uh, that worked with uh, me early on were Gil Strasberg from Israel and Laurent Longvern uh, with Clark Wilson on, in the department and, and uh, Di Long, uh, who is now at Tsinghua University, Zishan, and Ashraf Ratib, who is here with us um, uh, now, who's a researcher here at the Bureau. Um, and uh, then we're very fortunate at uh, UT to have many uh, geodesists and to have the Center for Space Research that we can interface with. Uh, uh, most of the work that I've ever done, I always try to go to the source. If I'm using a model, I work with a model developer or if I'm using, so it was great to, to have a, a Center for Space Research, Himanshu Save, uh, Jen Li Chen and Clark Wilson at the department. And then also work with the uh, folks at the uh, JPL who process the data. Himanshu processes the data here, but also uh, David Weiss and Felix Lander at JPL, uh, NASA JPL. And um, we're looking at a lot of hydrology issues and uh, work with the uh, hydrologists throughout the U.S. and in other regions. And we work closely with the U.S. Geological Survey. And uh, we had a project uh, funded by NSF and uh, uh, in which we had NASA scientists and USGS scientists. And that was fantastic. And we had a week each summer where uh, both were together and talking to each other. Most of the time, you know, it's hard to be allergic to somebody when you're right in the room with them and when you talk with them. And so it was a great opportunity. And we had a day off in midweek when people just chilled and went out and did some activities. And so I think there was a lot of exchange uh, there. And now we're seeing the advantages of uh, some of that. So Jay Femietti and Matt Rodell, who were here at UT, and uh, Alex um, son here at the Bureau, and then various folks at the U.S. Geological Sur Survey, Lenny Conoco, uh, Ward Sanford, and Claudia Font, who works in the Central Valley. Um, and so uh, um, I think we're really seeing uh, some very good outcomes from that exchange because now we showed that the gray satellite data differed from some of the USGS regional models. And at first uh, uh, people said, well, is it the satellite data is correct or is it the models that are correct? And, um, and uh, the USGS uh, acknowledged that their models weren't very um, uh, correct because they were crude and, and early assessments. And, and so now their new models uh, are consistent with gray. So, so that was that's really cool. And we only saw that uh, the other day. Uh, and so I think NASA really wants to see more applications of the satellite data. Uh, and I think uh, we will see uh, USGS using it more to calibrate uh, their models. And um, 
Then uh, one of the things that came up was uh, the um, people like Himanshu Savi at Center for Space Research was really tired of people saying, oh, Grace is, you know, has so much uncertainty, it's so coarse scale and everything. And, and uh, a lot of people rely on global models. And he said, well, I think there's a lot of uncertainty in the global models. And uh, so we did a comparison of the Grace satellite data with the global models. Um, and uh, the, the global modelers uh, here shown on the right, they all uh, collaborated with us. It was uh, totally unfunded. That's where you do most of your uh, interesting research is uh, uh, on the side. We're always working on the side. And uh, that was a, a really a nice analysis and I think uh, very helpful. Um, so uh, I really appreciate all the collaborations I've had with various people. Uh, so this is the outline for the talk. I'll give some background information on GRACE data and then talk about global hydrologic models, which the UN uses a lot and many other agencies and, and how reliable they are. And then talk about the uh, causes of water storage changes. Uh, is it uh, climate extremes, droughts and floods, or is it uh, human water pumpage, or is it both, and how do they interact? We need to understand the causes if we are going to develop appropriate solutions to these. Um, and then the impacts that the satellite data have had on water policy and the potential in the future, because when people see these uh, images and stuff, they really get excited. And so it has really an opportunity to affect uh, policy. And then more recently, operational applications with the U.S. Drought Monitor and Ashraf and Alex are working on a five-day flood monitor uh, forecasting uh, approach and then talk about the, what the future looks like. Uh, so I'm sure over the years, many of you have heard about the GRACE satellite data. It's uh, not uh, a religion, but it stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. And uh, it was launched on St. Patrick's Day in 2002, uh, which may um, uh, be a religious connotation. But um, And uh, it's uh, two satellites that uh, were launched at about 500 kilometers above the Earth. And by measuring the distance between those satellites, they're about uh, uh, to sub-micron scale resolution, we get variations in the Earth's gravity field uh, at about monthly time scales. And the dominant control on variations in gravity is water movement. Uh, and I'll show a NASA clip on that in a minute. Uh, so the resolution is about 350 kilometers which for hydrologists when we're used to using borehole data and looking at small aquifers and stuff is just a bit difficult to, to grasp initially. Um, and uh, we measure changes in water storage, a gigaton mass change is equivalent to one cubic kilometer of water storage change or about one million acre feet. Uh, so it's a terrestrial water storage. So it's water storage from the atmosphere to the moho. And so then we have to figure out where is the water storage changing? So they remove the atmospheric effect. So then we have to figure out, is it surface water? Is it soil moisture? Is it groundwater? And sometimes we think that it's a disadvantage that it's terrestrial water storage. It's the total thing, but actually sometimes it's good to have the total estimate um, and gives you the balance. And I'll show that later. Uh, it was recognized as an essential climate variable last year by the uh, Global Climate Observing System, and that's really uh, important. And so always in the past, uh, people paid very little attention to the total water storage, and they were always jumping to its uh, reservoir storage or its groundwater storage. But I think total water storage has is very important in its own right, and, and we should evaluate that first before we jump to trying to figure out uh, where it's changing. Um, so I'd like to just play this uh, clip from NASA. Gravity. It's everywhere. It's the force that keeps our feet on the ground and the moon orbiting Earth. But where does it come from? Mass. That's simply the amount of stuff that makes up an object. The more mass something has, the more gravity it has. Earth's gravity is constantly changing because something with a lot of mass is moving around all the time. What's moving? Water and ice. If you've ever picked up a bucket of water, you felt just how much mass it has. It creates a lot of gravity. Using satellites, NASA can measure Earth's gravity like a scale in the sky. By comparing one month to the next, 
we can track where the water and ice is going. Weaker gravity means there's less water in that spot. This can tell us where a glacier is melting or a severe drought is drying up lakes. And stronger gravity? More water such as in the rainforest in the Amazon. Our scale in the sky even lets us measure water deep underground. So I think uh, this was a very nice um, uh, clip on trying to help us understand uh, what the uh, grace uh, tells us and in, in, in its value. And so it gives us the big picture. Um, and it's like a parent uh, with kids, you know, you always want them to be what they aren't. <laughs> so people, I mean, having the big picture is, is very valuable. Uh, but hydrologists and everything, they always say, oh, can you get it down to much lower and lower resolution? But I think it's important to, for us to understand what's happening at water uh, and water at continental scales or large scales and, and stuff like that. So uh, the uh, decadal strategy um, was uh, published in 2018. It's a National Academy of Sciences report and um, mass change was listed as one of five uh, designated observables within the strategy. So that's very valuable. And so they recognize the, the importance of it. And uh, um, so uh, I don't know if any of you saw the 60 minutes um, blurb that was published in or uh, that came out in 2014 with Leslie Stahl talking to Mike Watkins about gray satellite data and I thought this was a really nice um, um, uh, 60 minute episode because it gave equal weight to the satellite data and to the ground-based monitoring so at the bottom of this picture you can see uh, Leslie and uh, Claudia Font uh, who was monitoring water levels in the Central Valley uh, so I can remember going to an AGU meeting and somebody here from Lower Colorado River Authority saying that, well, with satellites and global modeling and everything, we, we don't need to do any monitoring and we can just rely on, on those products. But I think this 60-minute uh, episode said we need everything and we, and we do more than ever. Um, so if we try to make up a, an image of how water storage was changing based on groundwater level data, so this gives you an idea from the International Groundwater Resources uh, Assessment Center, the, the distribution of groundwater level data from, that we have from different countries. So you can see we have very little coverage in Africa and some countries don't share their data. And, and so it's very difficult to, to build a, a large scale picture from a point data. And even at uh, point scales, as most hydrologists would know, sometimes we have wells that uh, penetrate shallow unconfined aquifers and deeper confined aquifers. So converting a water level change to a storage or a water volume uh, you know, those storage coefficients can change over three orders of magnitude. So I know in the Central Valley, they'll have wells and they don't know whether they're getting their water from the deeper confined part or the shallow. So it's, it's difficult to estimate storage from the point up, just like it's difficult to scale down grace data from, from large scale. So we have problems with everything. Um, so now I would like to talk about uh, the comparison between uh, grace data and uh, global hydrologic models. So when we did this uh, study uh, several years ago, there were two basic types of global models. Uh, one was hydrologic models that were uh, generally developed to, to evaluate water scarcity. So they included um, uh, daily water balance and um, human water use reservoir management. And the intersectoral impact model intercomparison project uh, now calculates terrestrial total water storage to compare directly with GRACE which is a nice uh, advance. The other type of models were the, the land surface models that were developed by the uh, climate uh, community. And uh, these were uh, developed to provide lower boundary conditions for climate models. So they're more physically based, but they don't include a lot of the human impacts such as surface water, groundwater storage, or water use or reservoir management. And uh, now there have been a lot of advances since this time. And so they're more hybrid models and they, they've been uh, incorporating different things. So we compared the trends in store, uh, total water storage from 2002 to, to 2014. Um, and, um, and here you can see the blue areas where we saw increasing trends in water storage and uh, the red areas are where we saw decreasing uh, trends. Um, 
So you can see Amazon um, increasing uh, trends in water storage up to 40 cubic kilometers per year. So about uh, almost 40 million acre feet a year increase in water storage. So the trends is the smallest part of the signal. I mean, in, in the equation, the, the huge signals are the seasonal signals. But over this time, then we calculate these trends. Uh, the Okavanga and Zambezi area in Southern Africa, increasing trends in water storage over this time. The Ganges, uh, Brahmaputra, the Tigris Euphrates, uh, declining trends, the high river basin, the North China Plain. And um, uh, I don't know if I can't get the pointer to, oh, sorry, pointer to work. Um, and uh, parts of Eastern Australia, they were recovering from the millennium drought from 2002 to 2010. And so over this uh, time period, then up to 2014, we saw increasing trends. So if we compare to these then uh, with the, the uh, GRACE data and with the global models, and uh, Monica Korsha and her group at uh, the Jackson School helped us develop some of these images, which were very helpful and I appreciate their input. So this bar chart on the left shows uh, the Mississippi River Basin. So the first uh, three gray bars are for different grace processing and the different centers process it in different ways, which is really nice and gives us an idea of the uncertainty in grace data. And then the blue are the hydrologic models and uh, the uh, green are the land surface models. So you can see that there's a lot of variability even within the GRACE data and uh, the hydrologic models, the two hydrologic models, they're quite different and the land surface models, uh, quite a lot of variability in those also. So um, a lot of uncertainty. Now the Amazon, 6 million square kilometers, the largest basin globally. So you can see a good consistency among the GRACE solutions because it's a large basin and GRACE gets the big picture. But you can see the hydrologic models are quite different from each other and from GRACE. Uh, and so we worked with the, the models, we gave them time and we took their data. So we want to make sure that we were representing it correctly. Uh, the land surface models most underestimate uh, the increasing trend in water stores that we see from GRACE. Uh, so some have almost no storage change and others declining uh, trends. So the Okavanga, uh, it's an internally draining basin. So they had increasing rainfall over this uh, time period. And so it collects in the basin, but all of the models simulate all that water running off to the oceans. So they didn't uh, simulate uh, endorheic basins or internally draining basins. So they underestimated the increase in storage in the Okavanga. Uh, the high North China Plain River Basin, uh, the GRACE data show declining trends. The hydrologic models show uh, greater declines in storage. That's the only place really that we saw that the models showed overestimated the, uh, the storage trends from GRACE. And, uh, but the, one of them had to be calibrated to, to, to do that. Uh, and the land surface models, because they don't incorporate human water use that much, they showed almost no storage change. Um, and lastly, the Ganges uh, region, so Grace showing declining trends in storage and Matt Rodell published this in 2009 and uh, created a lot of um, interest, uh, but the, the global models all underestimating the, the declines in storage that we see uh, from Grace. So when you see these sorts of things, you just say, well, can we have confidence in anything and which one is right? And, you know, but that's healthy. Uh, I mean, to, to be skeptical and to, to compare different things, always uh, trying to understand uh, uncertainties. Um, so um, I think uh, with that, uh, the, the, uh, the global climate, uh, the modeling community has uh, tried to compare directly with GRACE data. They calculate terrestrial water storage directly. And, and uh, so the model intercomparison programs are now comparing with GRACE and they're using the GRACE data to constrain their models. Um, and also for the regional models, uh, the USGS, their regional models, they are uh, going to be using GRACE data to constrain their models too. So next, I want to talk about the uh, causes of water storage change. Is it uh, climate? Is it humans? Uh, I mean, if you say it's humans and it's over pumping of groundwater, then you say, well, the solution is decreased pumpage. If it's a drought and it's natural depletion of groundwater in response to the drought, then you don't, it's not pumpage. Uh, 
uh, and uh, you will be surprised at what people think is going on. And oftentimes, the first study that somebody does, people believe that it's like gospel, and people always refer to the first study. Um, but we, we're continually looking at more and more data and improving our analysis. But for whatever psychological reason, we think that first uh, output stays in our mind. And, and we want to rush to get everything out so quickly. So we don't do due diligence oftentimes in looking at many things. We have to get things out as fast as possible. Um, so looking at uh, this, uh, I'm showing two examples. The first is the Yokovanga region, uh, and NASA developed these clips also showing increasing and decreasing storage related to climate because there's no irrigation. Irrigation is the elephant in the room and there's very little irrigation in Sub-Saharan Africa. So climate is the primary driver there. And the other is Saudi Arabia, where you can see increasing irrigation circles and expansion of irrigation causing storage change. Oh, sorry, yeah. So you can see here that the total water storage is increasing and peaking around 2011, 2012 in response to increasing rainfall and then uh, declining. And that's uh, showing the rainfall uh, records over that time period. And then followed by uh, drought conditions or drying conditions and the total water storage decreasing in response to uh, drought. Uh, so that's natural variability in the Okavanga. And then in Saudi Arabia, then you can see declining water storage, um, uh, monotonically declining over time. And here we're showing uh, uh, irrigation circles expanding 2000, 2012. And uh, then the uh, Saudi government uh, uh, de uh, put a moratorium on irrigation. And so then maybe that's uh, showing the leveling off of water storage towards the end, the policy change to reduce irrigated agriculture in Saudi Arabia. So that's a human uh, impacts on water storage. Um, so Matt Rodell at NASA, he did his PhD here at uh, the Jackson School, and uh, he published this uh, study in uh, um, 2018. And uh, he tried to, to link uh, the water storage trends that he saw from 2002 through 2016 uh, to the causes of water storage changes. And so the leaders then reflected the uh, different causes that are listed on the lower left part of the graph. So the red is climate, so Greenland, uh, um, Alaska, uh, and uh, Antarctica, uh, ice sheet melting and declines in storage. Um, and then uh, probable human impact, that also looks kind of red. So the Southwest US, the Central Valley, uh, Southern High Plains, um, Northeast Brazil, those regions, the uh, Middle East, uh, Ganges, those regions, uh, uh, problem of human impact. And then uh, the green uh, shows a natural variability. So he tried to, uh, so you can see in many regions in South America, the Amazon uh, and uh, drought in Northeast Brazil linked to natural variability. So I thought it was a very nice uh, study and a nice analysis. Um, so Ashraf Ratab um, then looked at uh, which of these trends exceeded the interannual variability and uh, looked at uh, trends that exceeded three standard deviations of interannual variability. And that's shown by the uh, uh, dotted uh, points. So most regions, actually, the Southwest US, and this is over a longer time period, 2002 to 21, Southwest US declining water storage, uh, exceeding interannual variability. Uh, Northern High Plains, the Great Lakes region, increasing storage. Um, Northeast Brazil, so much of the Middle East, uh, Europe over this time period, uh, the Ganges declining storage. Um, so trying to understand uh, what's causing these uh, storage uh, changes then is very important. Uh, so here you can see uh, the Central Valley and we oftentimes hear what's going on in California. Um, do you have any idea why the pointer is not working? Um, Michael, sorry. Okay. 
Yes, yeah. Oh, okay. So it's that one. It's not this one. No, that's it for the bends. The first one. Is okay. The oh, okay. So just hold it down. So you can see the Central Valley declining storage during drought, and they had a big drought from 2012 to through 2016, and then they had atmospheric rivers in January 2016, and the drought ended overnight. I absolutely love looking at the US Drought Monitor time series, and you see the drought ended overnight. The same in 20 in December this year. You know, atmospheric rivers, so they had a, a, another drought, and then atmospheric rivers ended the drought, and then they have flooding. Bit like Texas, you know, we're either in drought or we're having flooding. So, and and I think people are beginning to recognize that there was a UN water conference in New York this year, and they said too much, too little, and too polluted. So we're either trying to deal with too much water flooding or too little water drought. And it's managing those extremes, I think, is uh, really important. In the past, it was always like water scarcity, we're running out. I think it's really trying to manage the extremes is more uh, important. So South America, uh, so you can see a lot of interannual variability, uh, but uh, we know from groundwater level monitoring over the last century that there's been a long-term decline because the recovery is never enough uh, to overcome the depletion during drought. South America, uh, you know, increases and decreases in storage in different regions. Um, and then the Middle East uh, and North Africa, you can see overall declining trends uh, there in most of these aquifers, Nubian, uh, Iran, uh, and those areas uh, related to, to drought and to, to water use. Um, and then Southeast Asia. So all of these uh, graphs are at the same scale. Total water storage anomalies are shown in millimeters. And so the Ganges Brahmaputra region is the area where we see the largest declines in storage. Um, and so you can see um, huge declines in stores there, the Indus not so much, uh, the North China Plain. Um, and then uh, Australia, gray satellite data began monitoring in the middle of the millennium drought in Australia, which extended from 2000 to 2010, and then a recovery uh, related to um, uh, and so con changing and so conditions and then back to drought uh, again. So Australia, you know, either uh, huge droughts or floods uh, at different times uh, strongly linked uh, to uh, El Nino conditions. Uh, so uh, the upper Kalahari that I just showed in the, the clip, you can see increasing rainfall, increasing storage in this internally draining basin and then declining during a drought period. So um, Niger and Ogaden Juba increasing storage that people have attributed to land use change. Um, and then uh, so there was a lot of uh, interest in Northwest India and the declining storage and how Grace was showing the declines in storage. And a recent study then that was done by Alan McDonald and his colleagues, uh, McAllister and others at the British Geological Survey, where they collated the data from office records that had been uh, recorded over the last century. And they showed uh, the, um, and they're looking at uh, this uh, region, uh, Punjab, um, Haryana states in Northwest India and into central Pakistan. So here you can see the irrigation canal system that the British uh, developed over uh, in the early 1900s to uh, mid 1900s and irrigation with that. And then, so what uh, uh, they showed is that total water storage in this region increased uh, by over you know, 350 cubic kilometers and then plateaued in response to canal irrigation. Um, and so when you irrigate with surface water, you recharge, you can recharge groundwater. Um, and uh, when you irrigate with groundwater, you're just going to deplete it. Uh, so I remember being at an ERCOT meeting here in Austin, and the guy says to me, well, I got to go home, turn on the irrigation system so I can recharge the aquifer. Well, he was partially right because he was irrigating with surface water. <laughs> That's the source of the water. But um, so you can see a huge increase in storage because they, were, they had leaky canals and they were recharging the groundwater. So they were building up the groundwater system over the last century. So it's only in the last couple of decades then that we see an expansion of groundwater wells and uh, they get free electricity, the farmers get free electricity. So you can see they have been drilling millions of wells over the past couple of decades, but they had previously built up the aquifer 
uh, with all that surface water irrigation. So uh, it's, it shows you the value. The recent satellite data is very important, but it's a short-term record, really, when you look at the, the overall time period. Um, and, we, and we need to put things in a longer-term context. Um, so I thought this was a really nice study also. Uh, so uh, the Tigris-Euphrates basin, there's a lot of interest there. So you can see the Euphrates, uh, the gray state is shown in black and the models are shown in other colors. So you can see decline in storage during drought and it stays low for a long time period. A more recent work that Ashraf has done showed that atmospheric rivers then uh, resulted in recovery of some of that storage. So where is the storage changing? Is it the, the reservoirs? Is it the soil moisture? Is it the groundwater? So one of the earliest studies said it's all groundwater. You know, you need to stop pumping so much groundwater and irrigating with groundwater. Um, then the next study that Laurent Donfer did said it's reservoir storage. It's all surface reservoirs. There are huge reservoirs in this region. They've been declining. He was able to use altimetry data uh, to, to monitor that. So he says it's all surface reservoir storage. And then the next study said, well, it's reservoir storage and some natural groundwater depletion uh, in response to the drought. Um, so it just shows you how uh, the evolution of our understanding and applying more data can help us understand. So if it was the first study, you would just say, well, you need to stop pumping. But there really wasn't that much pumping going on. Uh, and so we really need to apply as many different data types to our work to try to understand what's happening and to, to come up with reasonable solutions. So another area is uh, the uh, Colorado River Basin. There's a lot of interest in that these days and uh, Ashraf and we are working with some USGS folks there uh, to try to understand what's happening. So the first study said, uh, groundwater depletion during drought threatens future security of the Colorado. Uh, and so I said it was all groundwater pumpage. Uh, but we knew, I mean, all you had to do was look at the USGS data uh, for water use and know that uh, the upper Colorado River Basin, 90% uh, of it is surface water irrigation. Um, and, uh, but uh, about half of the irrigation in, the, in Arizona is coming from groundwater. So then we did uh, an analysis uh, uh, when Zishan was here looking and extended the data back in time. And we showed that the Colorado is uh, subjected to these long-term droughts every decade and that there's been large declines in storage in the past. And in the upper Colorado, it's mostly soil moisture and reservoir storage. And in the lower, about half of it could be uh, groundwater storage. And USGS had ground-based gravity data, we had groundwater level data, and again, another unfunded study. But that's why it's nice to have internal funding to do some of these things. Um, but uh, so um, this uh, shows uh, the um, um, uh, water storage, total water storage trends in US aquifer systems um, uh, in various aquifers. Michael, can you get rid of that uh, thing on the top? I don't know. Um, uh, and so you can see declines in storage. This is over 2002 to 2017, about 30 cubic kilometers over this uh, period in the Central Valley, declines in Arizona, and declines in the Central and Southern High Plains, 40 cubic kilometers. But uh, the yellow areas are slightly green, show very little storage change. The Upper Colorado, the Snake River Plain, uh, Mississippi, uh, and then uh, slight rises in storage in the Columbia uh, and in this uh, region and in uh, Florida, in the humid eastern US. Um, and then we estimated groundwater storage by subtracting reservoir and soil moisture stores. This is Ashraf's work that was published. And uh, you can see that the numbers are quite similar uh, in these uh, regions. And so then we compared to those results with the USGS uh, data from regional models and groundwater level monitoring data. So you can see similar results in the Central Valley. Uh, they showed the entire high plains as declining, but we showed that there was increases in storage in Nebraska over this time. The time periods are slightly different, but the biggest difference is the Mississippi. So this shows zip, no storage change hardly, and this shows minus 60 cubic kilometers of storage decline. So which one is correct? 
uh, but we had them all in the same room. We had NASA and we had USGS, which was fantastic. Uh, and uh, so uh, that original model that the USGS developed, they represented the surface water uh, with um, very little, surf, uh, you know, maybe uh, just the large rivers. And they didn't uh, show the complete network. And so they've been revising the model uh, since then and uh, putting much more detailed surface water network. And so when you pump groundwater in the Mississippi um, based in this humid region, then you capture surface water. And so their model was underestimating that capture and so overestimating groundwater depletion. We tried to get that published, uh, but the reviewers wouldn't believe it because they said a regional model is much more accurate than gray satellite data. Uh, well, we said, but we have the uh, both people on this, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and so this is their, re their recent model. And so they show much more recharge and uh, recharge uh, from uh, stream leakage also, and very little groundwater storage decline. And I think that's uh, really cool. And they've been doing a lot of geophysics, looking at the surface water, groundwater connection, and all that sort of thing. But uh, so I think that's where Grace could help conceptually trying to understand when you had the net impact on total water storage and you weren't looking at individual components. And I think that was good. Uh, so now just looking at uh, climate impacts on water storage in the US system. So this is the Central Valley and you can see this is the GRACE data showing declines during drought. This is the US drought monitor and then recovery during a wet period 2010, 2011 and then decline during drought. And then this is the uh, this is what I love, you know, when they have atmospheric rivers and they end overnight. Um, so there was a strong correlation then between uh, Gray's total water storage and the US drought monitor data with a correlation of 0.9. So looking at uh, other basins then, that was the Central Valley. So looking at uh, Nebraska, you can see uh, declines in storage uh, during a drought period and then recovery and then decline again with a correlation of about 0.7. Um, in the um, central and southern high plains, then you can see we don't have uh, as good a correlation with climate because it's just a long-term decline in storage and these aquifers recharged maybe 10,000 years ago. But there is an amplification uh, in the trend during the drought because there's increased pumpage. And then in the Mississippi region, then it's more humid, so the droughts are not as intense. And uh, you can see you have, uh, you know, relationship with drought, but there's no overall declining trend because it's capturing surface water. Um, so that was uh, the linkages with climate. So a strong correlation with climate in most regions, except the central and southern high plains where there's uh, not much recharge uh, going on. So then looking at the, the impact of human water use. So irrigation is the elephant in the room in terms of human water use, accounting for 70% of water withdrawal and 90% of water consumption. So when people say, what's your water footprint? Uh, it's really important to say, well, what do you eat? You know, And then what's your water footprint? I used to say everybody should be a vegetarian, but I kind of, my, my son has a smoker and, you know, big parties with <laughs> so uh, I wasn't able to educate him very well, but it's it's not so much what's your what you're eating either. It's where's that food coming from. So if I'm eating almonds from California and it's a gallon an almond, you know, and they're in a drought, uh, should I be eating beef from Nebraska and they're not in a drought and it's more sustainable, you know? So it's more complex. Uh, but anyway, you can see the irrigated areas here shown in the Central Valley, the Snake, the Columbia, and the High Plains, and the Mississippi embayment region. And so what is the relationship then between irrigation and water storage change? So in the Central Valley, here I'm showing um, water use. So the light blue is surface water irrigation, and the dark blue is groundwater irrigation. So in 2010, which is a wet period, 70% of the irrigation in the Central Valley comes from surface water. They deliver the surface water from the north and uh, they irrigate uh, predominantly with surface water. Then during a drought, those surface water deliveries are shut off and because they have endangered species issues and other things. And so they're pumping 70% from groundwater. So it's, uh, but their total water use is not increasing uh, during a drought. 
but they're switching from surface water to groundwater. So you're missing out on any recharge that you get from the surface water, and then you're pumping directly out of the aquifers. Um, and so that amplifies the impacts of climate on water storage changes, that human water use and the sources of water. Uh, so the Mississippi then, they're actually pumping more groundwater from the Mississippi embayment region than they are the Central Valley. Who talks about that? Do you hear about it in the news much? Of course, it's not California. Uh, but uh, it surprised us. Uh, but as you saw from the GRACE data and now from the more recent uh, USGS models, they're not depleting water stores that much because even though they're pumping a lot of groundwater, they're actually capturing surface water. And so uh, a recent a wildlife, World Wildlife Foundation uh, study was saying, could we move Central Valley uh, Ag to Mississippi, Mississippi Delta? And, and, you know, most of the reasons that you couldn't would be socioeconomic. You know, you've got uh, all of the infrastructure and network in the Central Valley, uh, a migratory labor force, uh, and then you'd have reduced pests because it's an arid region. And so it's not that easy uh, to do that sort of thing. So should we move the food production to where the water is? Or should we move water to, to where the food? And, you know, we say, well, we produce most of our food in Central Valley. I mean, is it a thing to be proud of that you produce most of your food in the desert? You know, just, but it's a legacy thing, you know, and it will take a long time uh, to, uh, to change. Um, so this uh, NASA image, I think uh, it has had a great impact on uh, developing the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act in California. And here you can see, um, where they're looking at uh, total water storage um, over time. And uh, then around seven and eight, uh, a, a minor drought 2007 to 2009, then a wet period in 2010 and 2011, and then a major drought from 2012 through 2016. And uh, then um, atmospheric rivers, and then another drought. Um, and uh, then as we saw in December, 2022, uh, January 23, more atmospheric rivers. So this uh, I think really helped and JFM Yeti played a huge role in uh, working with the, the uh, political people and uh, passing the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act was passed in 2014 and said they have to move to more sustainable management over the next 20 years. Uh, so they've got 20 years. So it'll be interesting to see how it evolves. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't. So um, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act passed in 2014. And so you can see the various basins. So these are critically overdraft in the southern part of the Central Valley. And um, then they're trying to develop more sustainable practices. And so they have flood managed aquifer recharge, where they flood the fields in the winter to recharge the depleted aquifers and um, various approaches that they're looking at to, to try to make it more sustainable. Uh, so we talked earlier about Northwest India, the Ganges and the Punjab region, Pakistan and all the depletion. So these are a lot of the news articles about that. So what are they doing? The government uh, and the World Bank are working together. And so there's a national program then to switch from groundwater wells to irrigation canals in some regions. And so that would, uh, if you're surface water, then you would recharge these depleted aquifers. Um, Punjab, uh, you know, they're talking about uh, changing the electricity um, provision to farmers and to try to reduce groundwater use and some cities in Punjab then are moving from groundwater to canals and so you know in the summer every summer they have flooding so trying to manage these things is going to be a challenge but it would be good if they develop more um, can, uh, uh, canal systems that leaked and then recharge the aquifers and acknowledge that I mean the Murray Darling Basin they spend seven billion dollars to try to develop more water efficient uh, irrigation systems, lining canals, and all of this thing, and then they didn't re they didn't take into account the fact that they they lost that recharge, and so they 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 didn't help them with stream flow during the drought. So very important to have common sense. 
So uh, the UN this year uh, has uh, their mantra is, you know, groundwater making the invisible visible and recognizing the importance of groundwater. And I think Grace uh, really plays an important role in that at the large scale, um, making the invisible visible. And uh, now just talk briefly about some operational applications of GRACE data and what the future uh, holds. So um, NASA has been using uh, GRACE data to look at uh, drought impacts and working with the US Drought Monitor. And so they have a groundwater drought indicator and uh, uh, soil moisture drought indicators uh, that they develop uh, with the models and GRACE uh, data. But I would like to see them have a, a total water storage drought indicator without just uh, immediately jumping to soil moisture and groundwater. Um, so I think this is helpful. And then uh, Himanshu Savi at CSR has been developing a five day solution. Normally, they provide grace data at a, a monthly time scale with a, a two month latency. So you have to wait two months to get the data. So he's developing a five day grace solution that has global coverage. Um, and Ashraf has been looking at uh, comparing the grace uh, data, and uh, the uh, blue line uh, shows the uh, monthly data. And this is uh, Myanmar flooding in 2015, August 2015. And the five day data shows how it uh, tracks uh, the uh, floods much more accurately than the monthly data. Um, and so here, I, I don't know if you ever uh, look at the NASA uh, uh, thing. So sometimes, so that's a normal Myanmar region. And then during flooding, uh, they show the, uh, how it uh, expands um, water uh, storage. Um, and when you have nothing to do on the weekend, like I don't, you just play with these things and have fun. Um, so the next mission, so we had the original GRACE mission was 2002 to 2017. There was a gap of a year and then the GRACE follow on in 2018. And that's um, uh, working now. And then the next mission is called the Mass Change Mission. And uh, they are um, uh, hoping that that would be launched in 2028. So when they launched the original mission, they thought it would last five years, uh, but it was a period of low solar activity. And so it lasted a lot longer. They launched it at 500 kilometers above the Earth's surface so that it will have a long life span. The hydrologists would like to have them launch it at 100 kilometers rather than 500 so that they would have higher resolution, but then it would only last a couple of years. So there's a trade off, uh, you know, between all of these things between lifespan, resolution, uh, and uh, so, um, but the, the new mission, uh, the proposed mission is very similar to the original uh, mission, except that now they're losing using laser ranging interferometry uh, to monitor the distance between the satellites. But that um, uh, gives credit to the people that developed the original missions, show how uh, great a job they did in developing that original GRACE mission. And it just blows my mind, Byron Tapley and, and Clark Wilson here at UT and everything. So it's amazing. So uh, they're also working with uh, the uh, uh, European group. And so they have this, uh, the Europeans are hoping to have this magic mass change in geoscience international constellation which is uh, the GRACE's uh, polar orbit, and this would be uh, at uh, a 70 degree inclination and a slightly lower elevation. And so David Weiss did analysis looking at uh, the trade-offs and said if we, um, that this would increase the resolution of the total water storage from 350 kilometers uh, by, uh, to 200 kilometers. So uh, with the same uncertainty. So we would improve it by having both of these constellations, but this is just a complement to the grace. Um, and uh, as an example, the, another mission, uh, the Gochi mission uh, for oceans was launched at 250 kilometers, only lasted 20, 2009 to 2013. So that just shows you, you know, if it's launched at lower elevation. Um, so I'm, I'm working with the, the review board on this new mass change mission. And if I can learn the acronyms, I might survive, you know, <laughs> but I mean, everything is uh, acronyms. Even I was laughing, you know, housekeeping was HK. So if they can replace any words with an acronym, they will. 
um, so I think going forward, I think that the message that I would like to probably is that we need to look at all types of data. Uh, and so there are a lot of uh, different types of satellites uh, uh, available, uh, looking at different uh, aspects of the water cycle, and uh, then uh, modeling approaches, which we need for prediction and forecasting, um, global and regional modeling. And then we can't forget uh, the uh, ground-based monitoring and uh, then data analytics then to try to fuse all of these and uh, to get a good understanding of uncertainty. And so I think that would be uh, the uh, way forward. Um, so because nobody reads my papers, I have launched this podcast and uh, I'm having a blast doing it, but nobody's listening to it. <laughs> They're not reading my papers and they won't listen to my podcast. So I'm not sure how I can communicate with people. Um, but uh, this is the, one of the recent episodes with Mike Dettinger. I had originally recorded it in November before the atmospheric rivers and then had to um, uh, do it again uh, because of all the atmospheric rivers that happened in December and January. Um, so um, I, I hope that it will be helpful in the future. And uh, I, as my son used to say with his jazz music, I'm just trying to develop the fan base, you know. <laughs> So this is this was the Powell Research Group where we had NASA and USGS working together, and this was one of our days off, which was legitimized because we were doing kumbaya, you know, <laughs> and exchanging knowledge. Um, so to summarize, um, terrestrial total water storage is now an essential recognized as an essential climate variable by the Global Climate Observing System, and is incorporated into the global models and. Um, I think a gray state is helpful in trying to understand the relative importance of climate and human drivers so we can develop appropriate solutions to, uh, to water resources uh, and uh, to input uh, the uh, data then for decision makers and policy makers and then uh, incorporating it more for the operational applications like droughts and floods. Uh, so I would be um, glad. I, I really appreciate uh, funding. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these were sort of not externally funded, and I appreciate the Fisher Endowed Chair position and also the Jackson Endowment for helping us uh, do uh, some of this work. Um, so I'd be glad to answer any questions. Go ahead, yeah. Jeff. So, you know, unlike hydrocarbons, water seems to be conservative. So if you're looking at total water storage uh, from a snapshot perspective, I suppose gains in one area or losses in another. So do you, can you use that, those, do you see any long-term trends as far as places that are gaining and places that are losing and, and uh, what are those implications? Um, yeah, so I think uh, we see long term losses uh, would be related to groundwater pumpage and irrigation using groundwater in like the North China Plain or uh, the, the Ganges region, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, increases in storage, it's uh, more difficult to imagine that those would be long term because they are mostly driven well uh, by climate and so it's uh, a lot of it is uh, interannual climate variability linked to el nino or indian ocean dipole or things like that so they're mostly at interannual time scales so you will see those over a few years uh, um, for example the great lakes they saw increases in storage related to increasing precipitation from 2012 to 2017 you know that sort of time period but so uh, you can, you wouldn't imagine, so long term, the climate will even out, you know, uh, but maybe uh, some people are also saying those increasing extremes may lead to more groundwater recharge in semi arid regions. So there may be a long term change there related to that, or the land use change impacts that we have seen. Australia, Southwest US, when we converted from native vegetation uh, to cropland increasing recharge and long-term increase in storage over decades. And now they're seeing that in West Africa because it's more recent uh, cultivation. So I think the human impacts are more likely to cause the long-term changes, either groundwater pumpage or land use change, uh, if it's a change in one direction and the climate variability is more interannual. Anybody else got any questions? Are you all comatose at this point? 
<laughs> Nobody's comments up here, Bridget. Uh, so my question is the interface between the grace gravity data and land surface elevation change. How do those uh, sort of technically fit together? Because as an area like the Amazon, for example, you show that it has increased storage. What has happened to the ground surface elevation there? Is there some correlation? Has it gone up? I mean, what, how, do, how do those go together? Well, I mean, uh, it, it sort of depends, and I and really like the INSAR work that you guys have been doing with TextNet Scissor and stuff and showing those increases and decreases in storage and then the land elevation. So that's happening in the subsurface in the groundwater system. So when you increase, uh, uh, are, are you injecting uh, produced water into the subsurface and then you see an increase in the land surface because you're increasing storage in the subsurface? So the Amazon, I mean, I think most of that is related to flooding at the surface. And so if you have increasing flooding, like for example, Hurricane Harvey in Houston, uh, a lot of flooding at the surface and then depressed the land surface. Um, and, uh, you know, if you were uh, doing managed aquifer recharge and you really put in a lot of water into subsurface, then maybe you would uh, see an increase in the land surface. Or uh, the Three Gorges Reservoir, when they built that, you know, that increase in mass uh, depressing the, the land surface. And so the NSAR data would show a depression in, in, in the land surface. So I think they're starting to use these more and more together. And uh, I think, um, so for example, in the Central Valley, they saw subsidence from INSAR data where they'd never seen it before and, and, uh, and they hadn't been tracking it, but it was an area where irrigation had expanded and there was no surface water. So it was all groundwater. And so they uh, saw a d decrease in, in land surface. So I think, as I said at the end, you know, we have to use everything and look at everything. Uh, and so that's why I think data analytics, what Alex and Ashraf and these uh, folks are, are doing, trying to um, bring those data together will help us constrain, uh, understand conceptually what's going on and then constrain uncertainties. Bridget, thank you. That's such a great talk. Uh, I have a question about the um, atmospheric uh, water storage versus what you had showed as, as the terrestrial water storage. Uh, and I know it's very dynamic, but is it are there uh, data sets that can help us understand the trends in uh, distribution or changes of distribution in the water in the atmosphere? Right. So um, uh, the data that I showed, they'd already removed the atmospheric uh, water storage from the, the, the GRACE data because GRACE data, the raw data includes atmospheric all the way down. And, and so, yeah, there are, um, you know, uh, so they, they do monitor and model atmospheric water uh, vapor movement. And, and that's what the atmospheric river study that uh, Ashraf has been doing for Texas and what the, the people in California have done, uh, you know, with models and with satellite data, they were able to see that 90% of the water vapor transport from the tropics to the poles was happening in like 10% of the land area in these sorts of atmospheric rivers. So, and then they monitored that, then they would send planes out and they could see it and they can predict it uh, with about a seven day uh, period. Uh, and they can see it coming from the Western part of the Pacific to California and the Pineapple Express from Hawaii and those sorts of things. So yes, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thanks. And I'll have to check the podcast out. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? We do have one question online. Bridget. Okay. And it's from Carrie King. It says, can you elaborate on the fundamental question slash explanations that people are investigating to understand the seemingly large differences in grace versus modeled results of total water storage? Why isn't the answer, quote, the models aren't including enough detail? Also, can you elaborate on the paper you said was rejected where you focused on the issue with the USGS, NASA, and perhaps other co-authors on the Mississippi Basin? Uh, parenthetically, why really? did the reviewers reject? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so the, the first uh, question is, you know, there, the, there is a lot of uncertainty in global models. There is some uncertainty in grace. There's uncertainty in everything. And uh, so uh, I think um, 
the global modeling community are now taking the the grace data more seriously and trying to uh, understand what are causing some of those uh, differences uh, sometimes maybe they're not representing the surface water appropriately like we saw in the mississippi that original uh, usgs uh, regional model did not represent the surface water uh, very accurately and so missed uh, the capture that was happening when they were pumping the groundwater so all of my papers usually get rejected a few times, you know, and so, um, you know, I'm used to that. And uh, when you try to get to these high level journals, you never get a chance to respond, you know, so they say they just uh, whatever the reviewers say and, um, you know, you respond and they say, thank you very much, you know, so that's just the way it is, you know. <laughs> um, but it doesn't, it's not really that important, I guess. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Scanlon, for a great talk. Thanks. <laughs>